Okay, hi everyone. Thanks so much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Today I'm going to talk about a result which is joint work with Hans Bowden, and it's summed up in the title, Minimal Crossing Number Implies Minimal Supporting Genus. And this is a result in, in the field of virtual knots. Um, and it answers a, a basic question about virtual knots. If you take a, a virtual knot diagram with minimal crossing number, minimal classical crossing number, then it's automatically a minimal genus diagram. So it's a buy one, get one free sort of thing. If you've minimized the classical crossing number, you've automatically minimized the supporting genus. And everything I'll say today, uh, all embeddings and everything else are smooth. Sigma is always a closed orientable surface and I simply denotes the closed unit interval. And for the avoidance of doubt, by virtual link, I mean an equivalence class of virtual link diagrams up to the generalized Weidermeister moves, also known as the virtual Weidermeister moves. Here's an example of a virtual link diagram. And here are the, the new Weidermeister moves you add to the classical ones to obtain the generalized Weidermeister moves. And by the crossing number of a virtual link, which I'll always abbreviate to V-link, uh, the crossing number is the minimum number of classical crossings in a diagram of the link L. So we're ignoring virtual crossings here, we're just counting the classical crossings. And of course, this is uh, the, the introduction of such diagrams is, is due to Kaufman. And uh, another equivalent formulation that's also due to Kaufman is the following. We can define completely equivalently a virtual link as an equivalence class of embeddings of some copies of S1 into uh, a thickened surface, or so closed orientable surface times I. And we consider such embeddings up to diffeomorphism of the surface, well, diffeomorphism of the thickened surface equivalently, uh, and permitted handle stabilizations where the attaching sphere of the handle stabilization is disjoint to the image of the embedding. So here's an example. Um, uh, an example of the stabilizations, I mean, well, I could uh, fill this piece of genus in if I like, because the link doesn't actually intersect it, and I could add a handle as I like, as long as I the feet of the handle don't uh, mess up the link. Okay, so these are the two, there's, to the best of my knowledge, there's at least four different ways to define virtual links, but these are the two uh, that I'm going to be focusing on today. And in this formulation, the supporting genus of a virtual link is simply the minimal genus of a surface sigma such that that virtual link possesses a representative in sigma times i. And uh, there's a very uh, easy way to see an upper bound on the supporting genus of a link. If you give me any diagram, we automatically obtain an upper bound on the supporting genus like so. Take D, a virtual link diagram, and form a surface sigma sub D by the following replacement. Whenever you see a virtual crossing, place two bands like this, one on top of the other. And whenever you see a classical crossing, place this, uh, this um, piece of surface here. Then join up the endpoints of these little surface chunks uh, according to the rest of the diagram, follow the rest of the diagram, join them up. This will give you a surface with boundary, these yellow pieces here are boundary. And then uh, fill that boundary in just by gluing in disks. And this will obtain a, a closed orientable surface that we denote sigma sub D. And uh, this surface is known as the Carter surface of that diagram. And here's an example. Take this link diagram we saw before. We uh, essentially, almost if you think of the link diagram as a graph, and you think of only the classical crossings as vertices, you're fattening it up to a surface that deformation retracts onto that graph and then filling in any boundary components with, with disks. So then naturally, of course, if you give me any diagram, then the genus of this Carter surface uh, is an upper bound on the supporting genus. If that genus of the Carter surface is actually the supporting genus bang on, we say that the diagram in question is a minimal genus diagram, or sometimes we say that D has a minimal genus or is a minimal genus. 
But simply all, all we mean is if, if we form the Carter surface and we obtain the supporting genus, we uh, declare this to be a minimal genus diagram. And so uh, in light of these two competing notions, it's very natural to ask, does a minimal crossing diagram realize the supporting genus? If you think about it here, really sort of the only interesting, uh, the only interesting thing happening with respect to the Carter surface is, is from the, the classical crossings. The virtual crossings just put two things sitting on top of each other that don't really interact. The, the sort of interesting stuff comes from the classical crossings. So it's natural to ask, does a minimal crossing diagram have a minimal genus Carter surface? And the theorem I'm going to describe today uh, is an affirmative answer to that question. And uh, it, it proves that a minimal crossing diagram is minimal genus. So the Carter surface of a minimal crossing diagram realizes the supporting genus. And in the case of not, this was proved by Manturo. And that this holds it for links of an arbitrary number of components, virtual links of an arbitrary number of components. Okay, uh, this is the result I'm going to be uh, describing a proof of today, but I want to flag up uh, that it, this is actually a corollary of a, of a slightly stronger result that I think uh, people working in virtual knot theory uh, might find useful. So I'm going to, although I won't prove this just for uh, ease of exposition, the techniques that we'll describe uh, can be, can be uh, applied to prove this stronger thing. So if you take a, a virtual link diagram D, these techniques that are described can be used to show that there must exist another virtual link diagram D prime, which is obtained from the original diagram simply by converting classical crossings to virtual crossings. So taking some set of its classical crossings and turning them into virtual ones, we can obtain some diagram D prime such that D prime represents the same link so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a diagram of the same link uh, as D and D prime is minimal genus. So what this means is you give me any virtual link diagram, I can think of the set of all possible link diagrams I obtain by virtualizing some of its crossings. This theorem guarantees that somewhere in that set, there's at least one diagram that represents the same link as the original diagram and is minimal genus. Okay. So as I say, this is the this is the slightly stronger thing uh, that that gives us theorem A. I know that's a strange way to label the theorems. You know, the, the corollary is A and, and and the main theorem is B. But I, I hope you'll indulge me. Um, and as I say, for ease of exposition, I'm going to focus on this. But uh, to flag up, or it suffices to say that the techniques that we'll describe are all you need to prove this. Okay. Uh, what are those techniques? Well, uh, we give it the name homological parity for links, and this is because uh, it uh, reduces to the homological parity for, for virtual knots in the, that was defined by Manturov. Um, and again, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm going to, for the rest of the talk, by the word link, I will always mean a class of an equivalent class of embeddings of some circles into a thickened surface but considered only up to isotopy. So uh, I know this is extremely similar to the definition of virtual links we had a couple of slides ago, and, but the key point here is that we only consider, when we say the word link, we only mean such an embedding up to isotopy. We're not allowed to do general diffeomorphisms or handle stabilizations. Um, and then by diagram, we'll mean a link diagram drawn on a surface sigma. And so we have virtual links and virtual link diagrams and then links and diagrams. And I'll be, I'll try my absolute best to make sure I don't mix up these terms because uh, I'll, I'll try very hard to always flag up when I mean a virtual link diagram. When I just say the word diagram, I really do mean a diagram with no virtual crossings like this drawn on a, on a surface. And uh, because we're considering these things up to isotopy, two diagrams on a surface represent the same link, if and only if they're related by classical Reidemeister moves on that surface. So if, I'm, if I am uh, allowed to do, well, I am allowed to do classical Reidemeister moves occurring on disk neighborhoods of these surfaces. Okay, so uh, here's an example of, of a 
a link diagram on a surface, and we'll always use calligraphic D to denote these diagrams and Roman D to denote uh, virtual link diagrams. And so here's, we've done some rider master moves and, and they represent the same link. Okay, in the interest of time, uh, I'm, I'm going to go quite fast through parity, but I want to flag up that parity is an extremely powerful idea and construction that's originally due to Manturov and then and worked on by Elyutko, Manturov, Nikonov, and, and other people. Um, and uh, it, it has a rather innocuous looking definition, but it's proven time and time again to be uh, extremely useful in, in virtual knot theory and, and related uh, knotted, and the theory of related knotted objects. Uh, and often allows you to get slick proofs of things that are awkward and difficult to prove otherwise, or are simply not known to be provable otherwise. Um, and so I, I just want to want to preface this by saying that although it may look innocuous, um, it's it, there's a lot of, of horsepower in there. And the idea is simply that uh, it's a parity in the in the way I mean it today is a designation of the classical crossings of some diagrams as either even or odd, in such a way that that designation uh, interacts nicely with Rydermeister moves. And then uh, it turns out that, that such designations can, can lead to uh, very powerful arguments. Okay, so here's the formal definition. As I say, this is the, the parity is originally due to Manturov. This is not the exact definition he gave. Um, this is the definition tweaked to, to the case we need, but it's directly in line with the original definition. Okay, so let's consider a diagram on a surface and a function from the classical crossings of that diagram to Z mod two. And a crossing, uh, is, a crossing with image zero is referred to as even and a crossing with image one is referred to as odd. And we might, we'll call it even an odd designation, the parity of the crossing. A parity, sometimes known as a parity theory, is an assignment of such a function to every possible diagram on sigma, such that the following hold. First, if two diagrams D and D prime are related by a single Rydermeister move, then the parity of all the crossings not involved in that Rydermeister move is fixed. So if I do a Rydermeister move in a little disk neighborhood of sigma, uh, the crossings outside of, of that disk neighborhood, their, their parities are fixed under the move. Secondly, whenever I see a Rydermeister one, this crossing must be even. However, my, I've defined my function f, this crossing must always be even. Thirdly, uh, whenever I see a Rydermeister 2 configuration like this, I must have either both crossings even or both crossings odd. I cannot see a single odd crossing and a single even crossing. And finally, when we have a Rydermeister 3 configuration, uh, two things must hold. Notice that there's a bijection between the crossings of the leftmost diagram and the rightmost. And I've labeled it here, C1 goes to C1 prime and so on. We must have that the parity of CI is equal to that of CI prime. And we cannot see exactly one odd crossing in either diagram. So uh, it, it's not permitted to, to have a single odd crossing. And those are the referred to as the parity axioms, these, these, four, these four requirements here. Okay, as I say, this is rather innocuous. It doesn't look like, a, uh, but it's rather opaque why this would be useful. Um, and, I, and unfortunately, in the interest of time, I, I, I don't have the, the time to really flesh out why this turns out to be useful, but it, it does. Um, and I'll suffice myself by saying that very often parity theories turn out to correspond to lifting constructions. Of course, Virtual knots are closely related to these, the theory we just described of links in thickened surfaces. A link in a thickened surface, that three manifold has lots and lots of non-trivial covers, unlike the case of S3. And uh, 
it turns out that in many cases, parity is a way of concretizing some sort of lifting procedure using one of these non-trivial covers. In particular, uh, Bowden, Christman, and uh, Goudreau, they proved that the Gaussian parity, uh, which to the best of my knowledge is the first parity defined uh, historically, uh, they proved that the Gaussian parity can be realized in terms of a, a lifting pr procedure introduced by Turayev. And so in cases like this one, the general flow of information is that a parity theory is a combinatorial thing. It's defined in terms of diagrams. Uh, and the fact that it's uh, equivalent to some sort of lit topological construction, in particular, a lifting construction, gives you the, the topological side gives you the power to prove things, often relating to topology and geometry. But then the fact that it's concretized in combinatorics this way allows you to, or makes the proofs much slicker, sometimes much easier. No, that's very, so that's hand wavy, but, but it's a, a heuristic that, that underpins certainly the argument I'll describe today. Uh, it's very important to flag up though, however, that not all, this is not a general setup. There are many parities that are not known to correspond to a, a lifting process. Um, so this isn't always the case, but when it is the case, it, it can often be a, a very useful thing. So for the rest of the talk, um, I'm going to introduce a, a new parity theory and its corresponding lifting construction, and then show how this parity theory can be used to, to prove theorem A from the, the, the first couple of slides. Okay. So, let uh, again take a diagram on, on the, the surface sigma and suppose that gamma is a simple closed curve such that every component of the diagram intersects gamma an even number of times. Then by a gamma coloring, we mean a coloring of the strands of, of, of the diagram D, exactly one of two colors. I'm Today I'm using uh, green and red, such that when we move through gamma, the color changes. And then uh, when, if we, so in this case, say we're oriented like this, we go from green to red. And if we ever went back through gamma, it would go from, from red to green again. And by strands, I, I mean, uh, well, I know that this is not a universal definition, so this is this is what I mean. I hope this makes it clear. So here's an example of a gamma coloring. Um, here's that link diagram from before on the torus. If I pick gamma to be this meridian, uh, here's one choice of gamma coloring. And it's very important to note that uh, given a link diagram and a, a simple closed curve gamma, there are uh, many. Uh, there are two to the number of components of the link diagram worth of gamma colorings. But we don't really need to care about that for, for today's purposes. We just pick one and run with it. So once we've equipped a diagram with a gamma coloring, we make the following definition. So as I say, let D be equipped with a gamma coloring uh, and define this function on the crossings of that, of that diagram. Crossings involving strands of the same color are sent to zero, they're declared to be even, and crossings involving strands of different colors are sent to one, they're declared to be odd. Okay, and there's no process for guessing that this is going to turn out to be a parity, but we haven't said it yet because we need to, to prove it. But before we prove it, I want to uh, point out something that we'll be using freely for the rest of the talk. If a diagram D prime is obtained from another diagram, by a Rydomized move, then uh, a gamma coloring of the original diagram D induces a gamma coloring of D prime. So here, here's an example of that occurring in a Rydomized two. We can just take the colored strands and just move them around with Rydomized moves as we like. And uh, we'll be freely using this whenever we have a sequence of virtual link, sorry, a sequence of link diagrams We'll, and we color one of them, we'll always propagate that coloring through the entire sequence. So, uh, as I alluded to, this function is actually going to give us a parity. 
uh, as stated here in this proposition. And it simply boils down to approving this rather, simply boils down to checking the Rademeister moves. So here's an example. Uh, say we were in the case of Rademeister 2 here, and I've drawn a possible location of the simple closed curve gamma like this. If you color all of these strands uh, in all the possible ways they could be colored, you'll notice immediately that there's either zero or two odd crossings. There's no way you can get this configuration, even with a different choice of gamma, there's no way you could get this configuration to be either both, sorry, there's no way you could get this configuration to support a single odd crossing. Okay, so you do these checks and you see that this designation really does define a parity satisfies the parity axioms we saw before. And we'll uh, refer to this uh, as the gamma parity. Now, uh, if you're really on the ball, you'll be thinking, well, there's multiple color, there's multiple gamma colorings for every diagram. Um, and we're calling this the gamma parity. Yeah, we're sort of ignoring the fact that we could have picked many, many uh, other gamma colorings. And in general, the parity of these crossings of the link diagram D will depend on the coloring. It doesn't just depend on gamma, it depends on the coloring. Um, but as I say, for our purposes today, we don't need to worry about that dependence. We just pick one and go. Um, and uh, we're using the phrase homological parity because in the, in the case of knots, if our link diagrams actually represent knots, then this recovers the homological parity uh, defined by Manturov. And it's called the homological parity because another way you can define this is by thinking of the homology class represented by gamma. Um, and just a couple of words on, on, on the not case. Manturov does not define this in terms of colorings and a simple closed curve. Um, he uh, defines this by um, looking very looking locally at a single crossing and resolving the crossing in one of two ways and then making a check. Uh, so that's a sort of local definition of a parity. And it turns out, again, in a sort of heuristic sense, it turns out that if you define these, if you define parities locally in that way, um, it, they often don't extend nicely to links. Whereas the definition uh, we've just gone over now is defined completely globally. Um, and so that's sort of the underlying reason why it, it, it is defined for links of arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary numbers of components. Okay, I said there was a lifting process and uh, let's describe it now. So take a diagram on a surface sigma and suppose we've equipped it with a gamma coloring. It turns out that equipping a diagram with a gamma coloring is equivalent to choosing a lift of that diagram to some double cover. So what specifically do I mean? Form the double A double cover of sigma by cutting open a long gamma, taking two copies, and then re-gluing. There'll be a picture in a second, so don't worry. Uh, and we'll denote that this covering space by sigma tilde. Um, yeah, so the our choice of gamma coloring of the original diagram defines a new diagram, uh, D tilde on sigma tilde. And this is specifically a lift. It defines a lift of the original diagram. So in other words, this, uh, as I just said, this choice of, of, of gamma coloring is equivalent to a choice of lift. And so this shows the, the diagram from a few slides ago where we had uh, combinatorics on one side and topology on the other. This is the uh, concretization of that, that we could make a combinatorial choice of gamma coloring. And that turns out to be equivalent to the topological choice of lift with respect to some cover. Uh, and how is this done? Well, we fix a bijection between the colors of the strands of our diagram D and the two sheets of the cover. So in what follows, we're using, uh, we're using red and green. So green will be the left-hand sheet and red will be the right-hand sheet. And here's the, uh, we're always going to be di drawing diagrams of the torus covering itself for simplicity, but uh, of course this works for 
closed orientable surfaces of uh, arbitrary genus. And here's an example that, that should hopefully elucidate this discussion about lifting. Uh, here's the, the gamma coloring we had before, and here's the, the lift that it prescribes. So um, uh, I've, I've drawn the two, the pre-image of gamma with respect to this cover here, um, which of course will be uh, of two components. And I've pre preserved the colors just to, to ease absorption of this diagram. Um, so what, what are some things to note? Well, if you're, you might be thinking, well, there's, there's two components of gamma and there's only one component here. So how is everything well-defined? Uh, and you have to orient everything. Once you orient the link and you orient gamma, this is all, all becomes well-defined and it turns out not to depend on the orientation. Um, then also, so uh, the idea here is that we should notice that crossings, uh, down here, sorry, crossings of involving the, the same colored strands, i.e. even crossings, are lifted to the same sheet, the two strands involved rather, are lifted to the same sheet of the cover. So even crossings survive in the cover. But crossings involving strands of different color, each strand is lifted to a separate sheet. So odd crossings die in the cover. When we lift this diagram uh, to D tilde, these odd crossings disappear, okay? So in general, as, as is noted here, we should note that the number of crossings of D tilde is less than or equal to the number of crossings of D. We can only ever go down when we lift. And it turns out that this procedure, this, this lifting process, uh, isn't just defined for diagrams, it's defined for sequence of, sequences of diagrams with respect to, to Reidemeister moves. So this is what we'll call fact one. If we take some sequence of diagrams uh, on a surface sigma related by Rydermaster moves, and we equip D1 with a gamma coloring, uh, as, as noted before, this allows us to propagate that gamma coloring throughout the whole sequence. And we do that. So now we consider the entire sequence to, to uh, each diagram in the sequence to possess a gamma coloring. And we'll denote by uh, DI tilde all of the lifts of each and of each element of the sequence here as, as prescribed by that gamma coloring. Then this entire sequence lifts to a new sequence on the cover sigma tilde. So each, if D1 is related to D2 by a Rademaster move, then D1 tilde is related to D2 by a Rademaster move, always simply the identity. Might turn out that when we lift, uh, and we need to do a Rademeister move downstairs, so we need to do a Rademeister move downstairs, that Rademeister move might just become the identity upstairs, but that's okay. Okay, so this is what I mean by fact one, that everything plays nicely with respect to Rademeister moves. And here's an example. Um, if I start with a diagram on the torus and do some Rademeister moves, uh, I pick a, a gamma coloring and then propagate it through like, like so, then I lift, now this is the torus covering itself again, so uh, it might not look like we're lifting, but we really are. Then I lift as prescribed by the coloring, and I see what I get uh, on the lifted surface sigma tilde. These are all related by right and moves as well, or the identity, okay? And this is a little bit of a toy example, but uh, I do think it gets across the idea. If I start with right and master moves on sigma, I get a sequence of right and master moves on sigma tilde. And the fact that this that I get such a sequence, the fact that everything plays nicely with Rademeister moves, is uh, because all of this is fitting into something called parity projection, which is also introduced by Manturov. Whenever we have a parity theory, we can always do this thing called parity projection. Now, uh, if you're really on the board, you might be thinking, well, here's a lift. I'm taking a sequence of Rademeister moves and lifting up to a cover, but now you're telling me it's as a process of projection, um, which is of course going the opposite direction. Um, and yes, that, that's true. And it's just a, a unfortunate uh, historical development that um, in, the, in the 
context in which party projection was first defined, projection is the right word to use. It makes the most sense. Um, but it turns out that uh, there are contexts like this one where projection is, is the opposite word. But um, so again, I hope you'll indulge. Uh, I hope you'll indulge this strange bit of, of notation. But there's a there's a watertight historical reasoning behind it. In any case, I simply want to flag up that the fact that this behaves nicely with wider master services that are uh, is because this whole thing is fitting into the the theory of parity as as uh, introduced by Mantura. Something that's so fact one was was uh, it's fairly straightforward to prove once you identify that it's fitting into this setup. Fact two is harder to prove, um, and we're not going to prove it today. Um, suffice to say that it involves some uh, it involves uh, thinking very carefully about how this lifting procedure can uh, affect the Carter surface of a diagram. And so that, that's all I'll say. But what's the statement? What's the actual fact? Take D, a diagram on sigma, and suppose that there's some essential simple closed curve gamma, and a diagram D till, uh, sorry, D prime, such that D is related to D prime by Rydermeister moves and d prime misses gamma then it is guaranteed that there's some gamma coloring of the original diagram d such that uh, that d with that gamma coloring possesses an odd crossing okay so it might not be clear why that's going to be important now but uh, it really is the fact it's very important that you're able to show that uh, in this situation where gamma is essential and there's some diagram that misses gamma, the original diagram you start with must have an odd crossing. Okay. As I say, I'm not going to prove that, but uh, but um, I'm happy to answer questions about it afterwards. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, where are we? So we're going to put facts one and fact two together to prove theorem A. So take uh, a minimal crossing virtual link diagram. So it's a virtual link diagram that we've assumed has the minimum number of classical crossings across all diagrams uh, equivalent to it. And we'll denote by uh, we'll denote by calligraphic D the associated diagram on the Carter surface. Uh, so I told you at the beginning that if you take a virtual link diagram, you get this surface, sigma D, the Carter surface. Uh, it turns out that uh, you also get a naturally defined diagram on that Carter surface. And we'll denote by D that, that naturally defined diagram. Um, am I recording? Oh yeah, great. <laughs> um, so we'll assume towards a contradiction that the genus of this Carter surface is not the supporting genus. It's, we'll assume that it's greater than this supporting genus. Then uh, Kuperberg's theorem, a really extremely powerful and useful theorem in virtual knot theory. This theorem proves, uh, or rather guarantees the existence of an essential simple closed curve gamma on sigma D and a diagram D prime such that D is related to D prime by Rydermeister moves. And the, the, this is kind of the, the key thing about Kuperberg's theorem, D prime misses gamma. So essentially, uh, heuristically, what Kuperberg's theorem is saying, if, if you have a link diagram, a virtual link diagram, that is not minimal genus, you can always go down. The gamma here is some curve that you could destabilize along. Um, so you can always reduce in genus, which is distinct to say uh, classical or diagrams of the classical unknot. There are diagrams of the unknot for which you need to add crossings before you can reduce it to the crossingless diagram. Kuperberg's theorem guarantees that that's not the case for supporting genus. In any case, uh, we have this, the existence of these two things, D prime and gamma. Uh, let's denote the sequence of Rydermeister moves on this surface sigma d, taking d to d prime like this, and we'll refer to it as sequence star. 
because d prime misses gamma, d prime possesses a very particular gamma coloring in which every single strand is colored the same color. It never intersects gamma, so we can just color every component the same color and it will be a, a, an honest coloring. And then as, as, as always, let's propagate this coloring from d prime all the way through. Now, this doesn't mean that all these diagrams in, in the remainder of the sequence also are all colored with one color, because in this sequence, the diagrams might be isotoped through gamma, and they'll, they'll necessarily change their color on some strands. And we'll see an example in a second. But if that's OK, we can still propagate the coloring, and, and we do that through the whole sequence. Fact one guarantees to us that we can, once we've colored everything in, in sequence star, we can lift it to a sequence on a, a, a double cover of sigma d, which will denote sigma d tilde. So we lift everything and we get a sequence of diagrams, d tilde to d prime tilde, all on this, this covering space. And this is a sequence of Rademeister moves uh, by fact one. We'll denote this by dagger, sequence dagger. Uh, and it's very important to note that because D prime is colored with a single color, this means that D prime tilde is contained in a single sheet of the cover. Remember, coloring colors of the diagram correspond to sheets of the cover. So if our diagram is colored with only one color, it just gets lifted trivially to a single sheet. Now it follows that these two diagrams define the same virtual link diagram. So I haven't mentioned this yet, but uh, if you're not okay fair with this, we can go from a virtual link diagram to a link diagram on a surface via the, via the Carter surface construction that we uh, saw at the beginning. But we can also go the other way around. And then, so here's an example of what I mean. Here's D prime and here's D prime tilde. Because D prime is all colored with a single color, it, it gets lifted trivially up to here. And uh, or it just is trivially lifted to a single sheet of the cover. And what this means is when we go to define the, the virtual link diagram associated to each of these diagrams on thickened surfaces, they define the same one. If you really, really, really want to make this uh, totally precise, you can use Gauss codes um, to, to completely uh, I am this out. In any case, what this means is D prime and D tilde prime define the same virtual link diagram. Now let's denote by uh, D Roman DI, the virtual link diagram defined by calligraphic I. We'll do this for, for uh, diagrams with tildes as well. If we look at all of the, the virtual link diagrams defined by the, the diagrams of sequence star, and the diagrams of sequence dagger, we obtain the following. So we'll obtain this sequence of virtual link diagrams now. From Roman D to Roman D prime, this is the sequence of diagrams defined by the first sequence star. Then we get a Roman D prime tilde to Roman D prime, sorry, to Roman D tilde. And this came from dagger. But we've just justified to ourselves that these two diagrams uh, are equal. So we can actually, as a sequence of virtual link diagrams, concatenate these two sequences, and we obtain, uh, or rather we conclude, that the original diagram D, the original virtual link diagram D, and the new diagram D tilde actually represent the same virtual link because they're joined by this sequence of virtual link diagrams and generalized Rademeister moves. Now, fact two that we saw guaranteed that the original diagram on the surface, calligraphic D, possessed an odd crossing. And if we remember, not, I hope no one, I don't give anyone motion sickness by scrolling so fast, but if we remember crossings that were odd they are removed when we lift because the, the strands involved are lifted to two separate sheets of the cover. 
what this means is that uh, if our original diagram possesses an odd crossing, when we lift to D tilde, that crossing must be removed. And then on the level of virtual link diagrams, it means that D must have strictly greater, uh, a, rather a strictly greater number of classical crossings than D prime, because at least one of them has been removed, okay? In other words, it tells us that uh, the number of classical crossings of this virtual link diagram D tilde is strictly less than the number of crossings of the original diagram. And D and D tilde represent the same virtual link. But we picked D to be a minimal crossing diagram. So no such detail that can exist, hence we obtain a contradiction. Therefore, a minimal crossing diagram is minimal genus. Okay, I'm gonna leave that there. Thanks very much for your attention. And once again, thanks very much to the organizers for asking me to speak and um, I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions. Thanks.